given the fact that many of us are troubled by certain manifestations of irrational faith. We have worried about faith that denies evolution and states that the earth is only 6,000 years old. We've been turned off by faith that claims to determine exactly on what day the earth will end. Uh, I know I'm not alone in being turned off by faith that says that billions of people will literally burn in hell regardless of how many good actions they have done. So I know this may be a tough sell to some of you. But in order to start making the case for irrational faith within the liberal context, I want to start by talking about a play where people turn into rhinoceroses. Rhinoceros is actually the name of the play written by Eugene Ionesco, and the story takes place in a village where people are living regular lives. Beringer is a sloppy character with messy hair, untucked and wrinkled shirts. Beringer consumes, eats, drinks too much, is always late for appointments. His friend, his friend Jean, on the other hand, dresses in impeccably, always has polished shoes. Jean arrives early for engagements. And one day the two friends sit at a cafe where Jean offers advice to Beringer on how he can get his life on track. He says, Beringer, you really need to buy an iron and start doing your shirts. Tuck, tuck the thing in, please. It, it would also probably be good if once in a while you were seen going to a museum or a nice concert. Eventually, a rhino runs through the plaza. And then Rick from the Wild High Rehab Clinic runs after and says, everybody help the rhino. No, just kidding. Rhino runs through the plaza and people are stunned and the town goes abuzz. What is going on? We learn that one by one, people are turning into rhinos because of the choices they make. Gene turns into a rhino because he can't seem to figure out that life is more than appearances. Daisy turns into a rhino because although her heart tells her to marry Beringer, she doesn't follow through because some people won't support her choice. He's a bit of an outcast. So the playwright, Ionesco's primary point was actually to critique how people rationalized their support for Nazism. The, the essential difference between Beringer, he's the one person who never turns into a rhinoceros, and everyone else is that he refuses groupthink. He's not afraid to stand alone and continue fighting for what he believes is right. And the other characters become rhinos when they rationalize their abandonment of moral responsibility. With our tremendous important enlightenment background and focus on doing the right thing based in response, moral responsibility, we Unitarian Universalists have always needed to be careful to not stray too deeply into the forest of rationalism. Thinking is essential for our religious tradition, but if we depend on it disproportionately, we become at risk of losing some of our essential humanity, we, we might turn into rhinos. Now, we've been influenced, at least indirectly, by the likes of Soren Kierkegaard, who was a 17th century Danish existential philosopher. Kierkegaard saw the individual as a free and responsible agent deciding his or her own destiny. And according to Kierkegaard, this is based not on a rational examination of the evidence, but rather on an irrational leap of faith. So another way to talk about that, in my opinion, is that you can look at the reality of your situation and rationally determine that you have negligible choice about how you can act. You know, I'm on this train, it's going, what am I gonna do? What am I going to do? Um, and sometimes it's not the rational that gives us hope or inspires. Unitarian Universalism teaches that we play a major role in our destiny. And you can bet your bottom dollar 
that at times this requires a leap of faith. That can be uh, scary stuff. Tillich would call that an existential crisis of courage. The Unitarian theologian James Luther Adams said it this way, our faith calls us to be hopeful and to act hopefully even when the facts are to the contrary. Our faith calls us to be hopeful and act hopefully even when the facts are to the contrary. Now the good news includes the fact that this leap of faith can and does happen with theists, agnostics, and atheists. The point is that these are matters of the heart. We are based in love, and love is not always a rational thing. A couple examples that I think resonate for most people. You're at a public train station and you see a stranger. Never, never seen this person before, probably never will again. They become endangered, the train is coming. You are willing to risk your hurting yourself to help that person. That, that's not really a rational process. There's something deeper coming from you to go to do the right thing. This week, President Obama awarded a medal to U.S. Marine Dakota Meyer for making three trips, at least, into heavy enemy fire and saving dozens of combined U.S. and Afghan soldiers who were trapped and hurt, and many of them were at risk of being killed. This was not a fully rational process. As a matter of fact, I think his supervisors were telling him to stop, and he went. This is the kind of bravery we saw on 9-11 when people went back into burning buildings to save total strangers. Coming at it a little different way of how, how I think about irrational faith when I see it and, and admire it and want to learn about it. Uh, it goes back to when I was doing maximum security jail ministry in Chicago for a time. Thinking specifically of two young men, one was 19 and one was 20, both were facing 20 to 40 years in prison for wrongs they had committed. Yet they were both some of the strongest, most positive guys I've ever met. I, I still, they, they were both preachers in our worship service. I call them take you to the moon preachers. Unbelievable inspiration. And also they were singing leaders. And I remember uh, them teaching me one of my favorite hymns, which we don't do too much in the Unitarian tradition. Lord, I'm running, running and running. 99 and a half won't do. Lord, I'm climbing higher and higher. 99 and a half won't do. 99, Lord. 99, Lord. 99 and a half won't do. And I would just fly home from maximum security jail. <laughs> just right over the traffic. These guys uh, made me think of what Paul said, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. They were built up, strong young men with love. So for me as a minister, I like to say, where does this faith come from? What's it about? How, we, how can we Unitarians and Universalists learn about it? There's a fascinating new book that I've just started looking at and talking to people about David Brooks, who many of us look at in the New York Times wrote a new groundbreaking book called The Social Animal, Hidden Sources of Love, Achievement, and Character. And in the intro, Brooks says, we human beings are not products of conscious thinking. And conscious is more where the rational is happening. We are primarily the products of thinking that happens below the surface. Below the surface, our unconscious mind is an emotional enchanted place where passions and perceptions are tremendously important. That is the part of the mind that is driving human behavior. And, and we, as a, unit, as a faith tradition, have to embrace that. How, how do we uh, learn about it and use it for the good? Driving factors for passion and perceptions for some religious folks would be Jesus, as they were my friends in jail, or the Buddha for others. 
I think that we Unitarian Universalists have the human community as a primary influence and role model in helping us to take irrational leaps of faith. And so, and we have to be mindful of what our influence is. The, the people who went down the road on groupthink and became rhinos were being influenced by their fellow humans. So, so we have to ask, where are the positive influences for us on our passions and enchantments? There is a Jewish phys physician who um, writes great stuff on spiritual wisdom. Her name is Rachel Remen. She went to one of the top medical schools in the country, but it wasn't in her rational learning in school that she got to some of her deeper wisdom. She said it was only when she got into her practice and deeply listening to and accompanying her patients, that's where she says she met the will to live in all its varied and subtle forms. That's where, when she was accompanying human beings on their journey of ups and downs in life, where she recognized the irrepressible love of life, which is buried in the heart of every living thing. And she says through that, she said she herself was started to be used by life to fulfill itself. Used by life to fulfill itself. I, that doesn't sound like some rational formula. It sounds deeper to me. Sounds enchanted. And it sounds like something that I want our religion to be a part of. So I'll tell you one of my people who helped me learn how to take irrational leaps of faith. He's my minister from childhood and friend, Don Wheat. And he's preaching here on Dr. King Sunday, bringing him out from Chicago. Uh, he taught me about irrational exuberance. His favorite writers were big thinking existentialists, but Don lived his and lives his contagious enthusiasm with reading poetry out loud before dinner. I can see it like I'm there right now on a basic picnic table for dinner with the trees and the water, and he's reading some poetry that I, I don't understand it at all. I don't know where he got it from, but he loves this poetry, and his love of that poem stays with me. I think of Don out on a 40-mile bike ride in the Michigan sun, stopping to handpick gorgeous blueberries, bringing them back home to bake a pie, and serve that warm, fresh pie a la mode with some cold vanilla ice cream. And, and this is not a shallow guy. This is an urban Chicago Unitarian minister who did ministry on death row, helped, worked in partnership with ho homeless organizations, fought to get the guns off the street of the west side of Chicago. That stuff can get you down, but he lives hopefully even if the facts are to the contrary. That's an irrational faith that I need in my life. I don't know about you. Um, he, I remember he used to teach us as kids. Okay, you, you might have a mean teacher. Your teacher might not actually be very good. We kind of are learning you don't have the best teacher in the world this year. You might have some bullies in your class. But let's not focus too much on that. You know, you could rationally count it up and just say, okay, I'm going to be defeated this year in this class. But no, let's focus on a couple positive kids. Let's cultivate some more relationships. Let's go in a different direction. That's how he taught us. Here's the spiritual exercise I offer for you this week. Everybody's listening. The spirit, I can feel it. Spiritual exercise. Yes, Kent. Pick a role model in your life who's good at taking an irrational leap of faith. Study the person. Interview them, maybe. Write about them and decide to emulate one attribute of their behavior. Okay, so where do you need this? Maybe you need it in the area of retirement. Are you thinking about retirement, new to retirement, not feeling really like you've hit your stride on it? In retirement, many people have to change their game plan for life, not because the old game plan didn't work, but that's just a new context. So who is somebody who is being hopeful and acting hopefully, even if the facts are a little different, and embracing a positive approach to a retirement. Pick that person. Maybe you need to pick somebody who is in the second part of their life whose body is deteriorating. Most of us, 
say, we'll say that we'll be lucky if we live long enough for our body to break down. Can't run anymore, can't walk anymore, can't drive anymore, can't shop or fix your food anymore. Okay, you could look at the facts and rationally say, this is pretty bad, and I, I should just pretty much give up. But who is taking an irrational leap of faith in that situation and living with courage, love, and hope and embracing the positive? Study that person, write about them, and pick one attribute of how they're living to implement in your own life. That's the spiritual um, exercise for the week. Th this reminds us of Hafiz. Listen, when you're thinking about who you're going to pick, change rooms in your mind for a day. All the hemispheres in existence lie beside an equator in your heart. Greet yourself and your thousand other forms as you mount the tide and travel back home. This is mystical stuff. It's also scary. Most of the times when we need rational, irrational faith, it's scary, it's transformative, it's magnificent, it's all of the above. We need it for ourselves, but we also need it for our world. We need, we need irrational faith to help us stop damaging the planet. All the facts are there. Has Al Gore not convinced every rational person on the planet that the human beings are messing up? But the rational argument's not going to stop us from hurting the planet. It's going to take an irrational leap of faith, and we have to be a part of that. It, it's going to take an irrational leap of faith to get off our crack cocaine-like addiction to oil. All the facts are there. Gas-guzzling cars, etc. It's going to take an irrational leap of faith, not just a rational look at the facts, a rational leap of faith to start treating animals more ethically. We need to be a part of this. How we're going to do it as a community and individuals. It's both and. Both and. How can you embrace an irrational faith which allows you to continue fighting for what you believe is right? How can you embrace that faith to realize your fullest humanity? How can you embrace an irrational faith to make a new watermark on your excitement? Amen. Let's please join together, stand in body and spirit. This is from the